Yeah, Sean, thanks very much for coming on the Soda Process podcast today. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here with you virtually. Yeah, sweet. So do you want to start it off by telling the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So uh, currently I am the host of the Optimal Performance Podcast, which is um, just so much fun. I mean, I've been um, the host for what, almost three years now. We have a two, 278 episodes. We've, uh, we've interviewed Rob Wolf, Sean Baker, Mark Sisson, Dave Asprey, Luke Story, Jim Quick. I mean, the, 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 the guests have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm also a life coach, which is different, obviously, from a health coach. Um, I, um, I focus on personal development, professional development, relationship development. I do some strategic consulting for some, some companies that I vibe with my values. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur. I have online courses, and I opened uh, float centers in 2012 and sold those float centers a couple of years ago so that I could focus directly on this work. Um, a father, a meditator, a fan of psychedelics. Uh, I like big trees and rocky beaches. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 fin- it's really cool. It's a, it's an honor. I'm super grateful to be able to do this shit and make money. And like, this is my life. This is the, this, I get to do this and this is what I do. So yeah, I'm i uh, I'm, I'm a grateful person for sure. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, so let's take it back a little bit. Do you want to describe to me what life was like for you growing up? Sure. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I was a competitive kid, um, an older brother that was three years older and 10 times as strong. Um, so, you know, competing, fighting, um, sports, getting dirty was just my reality. You know, we, we'd spend most time outside. Uh, we didn't obviously have some on the weekends, but, uh, didn't watch, didn't watch much TV. Um, but spent a ton of time just roughhousing. And so as a child, um, I excelled in sports. Uh, I was the, I was the kid that would sit at the front of the class and raise his hand first. It was sort of like the class clown teacher's pet. Um, um, yeah, growing up was, it was, it was a, it was a nice upbringing, you know, sort of lower middle class suburbs of Seattle, um, here on the West coast of the, of the States. And yeah, I, I, I kind of came out this way, enthusiastic and uh, excited to be alive with lots of questions, sort of insatiable and competitive. And, um, you know, I've worked really hard at like, uh, honestly, like keeping that sense of wonder, that sense of, of curiosity in my life. And I've been able to be really fortunate in some of the things I've been able to do. And this is just the way that I like to live. And who knows what that's going to look like when I'm, you know, 60 or 90, but for, for now it's, it's, it's podcasts and businesses and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, I had a, I had a great childhood and, and, um, it's kind of formulated who I am now is like, I, I hate to lose. I like to win, but I fucking hate to lose. And, uh, um, um, and I live, live and act, I grew up active and, and have continued to, to stay active. Yeah, man. Awesome. So in terms of, um, what you wanted to do as a career, I can't always imagine you wanted to do what you're doing now when you were young. So talk to me about sort of when you were younger, what your dream was. Cause I yeah, can't imagine being like a biohacker, life coach, all of those sort of terms that you sort of do for a living now. What was it? What was the dream goal back then compared to what you're doing now? I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete. I think like most, you know, rambunctious boys, that was my goal. Um, I wanted to play football and then, you know, as a, you know, three sport, four sport athlete um, from seven till you know, 15 and then, you know, three sport athlete in high school it was, sports were a huge part of my life. So I, I wanted to be a professional football player. And then I focused on soccer. Um, I sort of made that choice at about 16 that that was going to be the sport that I specialized in. Um, and then uh, I thought, you know, as I realized that my professional athlete was not really in the, in the cards for me, um, I, I played semi-pro soccer after college, but it wasn't just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't going to cut it. Didn't, wasn't going to make it. Uh, so I got my degree in, um, um, communication and journalism. So I wanted to be a sports anchor. So I wrote, um, was the editor in chief of the, the college newspaper and that was super fun. Um, and, and those, those two mediums, those two, um, um, majors, the double majoring in, in those two subjects are complementary for, you know, for, for a lot of obvious reasons. And so 
I wanted to be a news anchor and, and be a talking head and cover sports. But I have this awkward voice that uh, that's like sort of scratchy and high, high pitched and somewhere between like West Coast surfer dude and, you know, stoner, you know, like, like it's so it's like it wasn't gonna work out for me I, that way either uh and so you know i i did a couple of different things you know after college um i was in sales uh i sold advertising at a radio station i really lived working at a rock station you know working at a rock station was a cool fun thing for me um but then you know found my way into entrepreneurship and and now i apply the same poignant as asking of questions in my, in my life coaching, in my, in my, in asking questions of myself and my biohacking endeavors. And then obviously with the podcast, I just, you know, communicating effectively, asking you penetrating questions, wanting to know the why behind things. Um, yeah, podcasts weren't a thing when I was a kid. And, and so, uh, and, and I had no idea what a life coach was. So the, that, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was going to be sports. So instead it's now, you know, competitions, biohacking, you know, performance stuff. Yeah. It's pretty interesting how things like that end up being the way they are, I guess. Um, yeah. So what sort of work are you doing with your clients now? Is it very much based around trying to uncover a hidden fear or limiting belief for them? Or do you try and get them to realize those sort of things so that they can turn their life around? Cause obviously you can't really do the work for a client necessarily, but you can obviously open their eyes up to a different perspective. So Describe to me what you sort of do with a lot of your life coaching clients. Yeah, you, you, you've, you're getting to it, honestly. The uncovering fear blockages. You know, what's getting in the way of you being the person that you want to be? What's, what's getting in the way of you living a life that you want to live? Oftentimes, it's fear in one way or another. Maybe it's a subconscious fear of, of failure. Maybe it's a fear of um, a rejection. Maybe it's a fear of success. And... And so, yeah, the work that I do now with the, with the various people in different industries that I work with is, first of all, do you have the energy to perform? Do you have enough energy, got enough gas in the tank day in and day out to do the things that you say you want to do? You know, if you're, if you're tired and lethargic and, and, and you can't muster an ex, a workout, you just don't have the energy to organize yourself and set goals, well, then we have to take care of that first. And so for, for a lot of my clients, how's their, you know, figuring out how their sleep is, what their habits are, you know, if you're sitting seven hours a day, we got to figure that out. You know, uh, if you're, if you're draining your batteries and your evening routine isn't setting yourself, setting yourself up for sleep, then that's a problem. You know, you, you, for those of you watching the video, you'll notice that I have um, yellow sunglasses on uh, these are blue blocking glasses from uh, Blue Blocks. Andy's in. Uh, yeah, because um, he's in Perth as well, actually. So that's yeah, right. Yeah, I've got a couple of pairs myself. I've got the um, just the normal computer ones, which I'm not wearing right now. I should be actually, but then I've got the yeah. um, the red ones for the nighttime as well. Yeah, yeah. So like finding finding effective biohacks to get people's energy up so that they can actually excel, so they can they can have some a little bit of oomph. And then beyond that, you know, it's, it's helping people craft a strategy, a plan to get the things that they say that they want. And if you don't know what you want yet, well, then we've got to figure that out too. We've got to discover the things that make you excited to be alive, the things that, uh, that allow you to experience yourself in an authentic way, um, to express your gifts to the world. And, and it's funny because a lot of people kind of conflate, you know, their, their mission, their life purpose with their profession. And it's just not, it's not very common. It's not very common that people can actually make money, let alone good money, doing things that they love to do. It's possible, uh, obviously, but if that's important to you to, to merge your purpose and your, your, your abundance with, um, with things that you enjoy, uh, then, then, we, then we figure out how to do that. So yeah, I use I, I really coach from, from sort of four core areas. The first area is classic personal development, you know, neurolinguistic programming so that you can get out of your way. What are you telling yourself, you know, when, when you're, when you hit a roadblock, what sort of negative talk do you go through? Um, you know, goal setting, having a high level of accountability um, with someone like me who is like 
accountable to themselves and also professionally trained at helping you do your shit. Like I will help you stick to the things that you want to do. If you want to have a podcast with a million downloads, we're going to figure out how to do that. But you need a, you need somebody that's, that's been there. You need somebody that can help you stay disciplined to it. Um, the second category is biohacking. So that is all the beautiful, wonderful things for recovery and gut health and, and exercise um, uh, all, all of the equipment, getting the most out of the least. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, by the concept of, you know, a minimum effective dose. How can you get the most out of the least constantly asking, how can I, how can I hack my schedule? How can I hack my, my exercise? How can I hack my, my decision-making, uh, my morning routines? And then the third category is professional development. You know, uh, um, th- there, a lot of people kind of, they kind of know what to do. That's, that's the thing here is like a lot of people kind of know that they should ask for a raise. They kind of know that, um, that they're wasting their time, um, you know, screwing around during the work day and it's not helping them, you know, reach the goals that they have. Um, that's sort of base level and at a higher level for people who are already really high achievers, it's uh, what sort of opportunities can you attract your way? Can you, can you, strategize an exit from Amazon and into a VP role at another tech company, making 20% more with a million dollar bonus when the company goes public. That's just one example of, of a client that I've worked with that, that we just, I mean, like, dude, he, he's just exploding right now. Uh, and then the fourth area is spiritual development. You know, um, um, I'm a, um, I'm an intuitive practitioner. I have some, I have some specific goal uh, gifts that I was born with that I've cultivated through, um, through working with, with other spiritual teachers, um, uses psychedelics, meditation. Um, I have some clear abilities that I apply to, to, um, the sessions that I'm in and everything that I do all the time. Um, but I help people sort of come, come to an awareness of their spiritual self that maybe they've ignored or they they've gotten away from, you know, maybe they're confused about God. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they believe in, you know, um, spirit guides, but they just don't have a, they don't have a, a method of, of, of developing or uh, developing or cultivating um, that relationship. So those are sort of the four key areas. And the, and the cool part is, is that everybody's different. Everybody's got a different bag of shit they're dealing with. Everybody's got different strengths and um, finding what that is helping people strategize in those four categories is, is the, is what I do. Yeah. That's awesome. Sense. Yeah. Like a pretty rewarding job as well. I imagine you get a lot of good feedback from your clients and that sort of stuff. But yeah, the one thing that um, is very, very interesting for me at the moment is the um, what you're talking about with the psychedelics and stuff. So I know that's something that's becoming a little bit more popular in the world of biohacking and stuff at the moment, um, especially with people like Joe Rogan talking about DMT and different bits and pieces. So what sort of um, psychedelic assistance do you do with your clients? Yeah, well, I, I do, I do a couple, Um, you know, for here's the disclaimer Um, only do psychedelics with their, where they are legal. Do not do them if they're not legal period ever. Um, the work I do with people is um, uh, centered specifically around psilocybin. So I, I work with people in, in both um, larger trips that they have. Um, I sit for them um, to have that that big that big transcendent experience, and then I also do some uh, microdosing coaching, helping them uh, fine tune their performance through this the powerful compound of uh, psilocybin. Um, you know, I've, I've done, I've done personally ayahuasca, I kind of lost track, you know, around 50, um, sessions and, um, that's a massively powerful tool, different, very different energy, very different lessons to be learned, but, you know, I'm a huge advocate for it. You know, if you think about the people who have, who have been the most innovative in the last like 30 years, most of them can point to a psychedelic experience, a, you know, an LSD trip that really opened up their mind that helped them, you know, envision the iPhone or, you know, um, you know, buy airliners or, you know, innovate in a, in a really, really meaningful way. It's, it's, uh, it, the tide is changing. The work that Rick Doblin is doing at MAPS, um, the research at Johns Hopkins University with um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, the use of psilocybin to, to have peak experiences and understand yourself uh, there's there's a shift happening and it's clunky and awkward, but but we're getting back to a place in the sort of 60s and you know late 60s or 70s 
where it was uh, it was not so demonized and it was seen as a tool and and not like this new thing. You know, we've been we've been using psychedelics to re. I mean, you ever seen the video of like a puma climbing up a tree and eating a rotten papaya and tripping out, ugh, you know, up in a tree, you know, um, animals seek out altered states of consciousness. It's, it's something that's innate to us. Um, we're, we're, we're drawn to it because it opens up our aperture. You know, if we're, if our world is sort of focused on this much, when you, when you work with psychedelics and entheogens, um, it just widens your perspective. You notice things that you never did before and you notice opportunities that you maybe never would have noticed before. Um, so it's a, it's, it's something that I'm a massive advocate for, and it's something that I've gotten a ton of, um, um, uh, benefits from, and it's, uh, it's a big part of what I do. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Like I said, it's something that's, um, yeah, seems to be evolving a lot at the moment. It's something that, yeah, I've been looking into a lot more and trying to, yeah, yeah I guess just research into it because it's, yeah, a very, very interesting topic. So, um, in terms of your life coaching stuff, again, how do you teach people to live a purposeful life and what are your biggest tips for doing so as well? Yeah, I usually, I usually start with, in, in order to shift our perspective, um, especially now, it's so easy. It's like being, you know, like we're, we're sort of promoting victimhood around the world, right? If you're offended, you're somehow better than the person next to you. You know, if, you're, if, if, you, if you feel wronged, by someone else's opinion and you take that personally, like, like that, that's somehow this virtue now. And it's fucking sad. It's, it's embarrassing and it's silly and childish. And um, so shifting from that, that sort of victimhood perspective in to be Pambi and Kumbaya as it sounds, thinking about the things you're grateful for, like really profoundly shifts your, your consciousness. So when you are thinking um, about the things that you're grateful for, waking up in the morning, thinking about like, holy shit, I'm alive again. All right, here we go. You know, I have this bed. Uh, maybe there's someone else in my bed. I'm thankful for them. Thankful for this roof over my head. I'm thankful for the fact that I get to like do fun stuff today and, and breathe fresh air and be outside. Shifting into this really simple, essential state of gratitude and, and, and anchoring that gratitude in the body helps shift perspective shifting perspective away from the world's out to get me. Nobody gets me. Um, I'm, I'm offended by, by other people's opinions. It's just, there's no glory in that. There's just zero glory in victimhood. So shifting into a place of gratitude um, is, a, is a really important first step for um, developing a, a trajectory in your life that will help you find your purpose. Because then your antenna change, right? If you're, if you're calibrated for being pissed off and offended and sad and victimized and sick and scared of this make-believe virus that's like keeping you in your home and, and, and just a scaredy cat, um, then, then it's hard to grow. It's hard to grow from there. Uh, when you're scared of your, of your neighbor, when you're scared to walk down the street without wearing a mask and you're waiting at home with the shades drawn, waiting for some unicorn vaccine that hasn't been tested to save your life, man, you are in a lot of trouble. So shifting into a place of gratitude, into a place of abundance, into a place of, of, of trying to do cool things in your life, that's, that's a really good start. The other thing is from there is to, is to be able to envision what your life might be like, is, is to, to really think about what your life could be like in 10 years. You know, I have this exercise where I have people uh, craft their uh, one day, 10 years from now, start to finish. You wake up in the morning, it's 10 years from now. You know, it's what, is, what day is it? It's October 8th, 2030. It's October, you're 10 years older. You wake up in the morning. Where, where do you live? What's your house look like? Who's in bed with you? Who else is in the home? What's the first thing you do after you take a whiz? You know, you work out, you make some coffee. Like what, what, what art hangs on your wall? What are you wearing? What's your plan that day? What are you doing in the world? And if your vision for yourself in 10 years is similar to the, the reality that you live now, there's a lot of work to do. We should be striving. It's okay to want things. It's, it's totally natural. It's this law of more, more life, more money, more happiness, more love, more peace, more joy. And 
So when you begin to be grateful for the life that you have, and then you begin to chart a course for um, where you want to be in 10 years, then you, then you start to strategize around how to get there. Well, if in 10 years, the vision of myself is like super fit, strong, focused, disciplined, sick car, like nice clothes, lots of free time. Well, how are you going to get that? You know, you have to be smart with your money. You're going to have to exercise. You're going to have to like meet people and, and, and make connections because the process is really specific to the individual, um, maybe your gifts are different from the person um, next to you. And how do we capitalize on those gifts? How do we, how do we strategize a way to, to make those gifts um, a value to the world? Because when you come and you provide value to the world, it comes back to you. And this is another key point for purpose. Like it has to be greater than you. You have to, you have to want to, show the world something that's never been shown. You want to be able, if, you, if you're going to be a bar, like cut a lot of hair, come up with new ideas, come up with new styles. If you want to be a podcaster, do it in a way that hasn't been done before, like work on that craft, but do it in a way that you're actually providing a value because when you provide a value, it, you get paid for it. It comes back to you. And, and I think a lot of people like sort of lose sight of that. And that applies no matter what you do for work, no matter if you're, you know, in insurance sales or real estate, like when you provide a value to people, when you are indispensable, uh, you, your value goes up and you're, you're able to glean the abundance that comes from giving that value. And then it becomes greater than you. What are you going to do with more money? Like, what are you going to get back? What are you going to grow? What are you going to create? So, you know, doing, doing actions and activities that are, that are greater than you as a person, providing value into the world is, is really a, a nice path to, to figuring out what your purpose is. Yeah, man, I love that answer so much because I feel like um, with just an attitude of gratitude, if you have that mindset, you physically, you physically can't be negative at the end of the day. Like if you're thinking about everything you're grateful for, you physically can't be negative at the same time. Then that actually puts you in a state where you can serve others and you can actually, yeah, like you said, be at service to the world. So yeah, I really, really like how you sort of, yeah, help to change people's mindset and perspective on that. That's really awesome. So on the topic of relationships as well, what advice do you give to people that might be struggling with theirs, be it an intimate relationship with a loved one or even a professional relationship uh, with colleagues and things like that? What do you see the, biggest mistakes people make and how do they sort of resurrect them? Yeah. Well, I think that one of the biggest mistakes is that we don't tell the truth, you know, um, first and foremost, you're not helping anybody by sandbagging. You're not helping yourself or the other person. If you're, if you're allowing untruths to be a normal thing with, with each, with each sort of padded answer, with each sort of like wiggling out of telling the truth, you're actually hurting the person. You know, you have to be truthful. It not only does it like clear your energetic field. So you don't have to remember, right? Like, Oh shit. What did I tell this one person? Did I fib on that thing? Ugh, I can't remember keeping it straight. Cause you gut aches, you know? Um, and I know we all know people like this that just like, come on, man. Like, uh, you're not telling, you're not being forthright. You're not telling the truth. Uh, that's a big, that's a big first step is to be absolutely truthful, boldly truthful. You know, um, people will respect you for it. And, and the, the, the relationships that are built on untruths that are built on lies that are built on deceptions or sort of like wiggling out of, of, of what's really going on are not, are not based. They don't have a great foundation. So you have to tell the truth. You know, I've, I've been, um, I've been with, uh, my same, as you hear my kids in the background, oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you, I've been with my, my wife um, since we were 15. So wow. uh, we were high school sweethearts, uh, stayed together. With, um, literally in, in, in every aspect. And I know that that's totally unique, but you can imagine how many lessons I've learned and she and I, I have that I, I took me a long time to learn this, but one thing that really helps to, uh, to remember is that you can't assume you know what the other person is feeling. 
there's nothing that bothers me more when other people say, well, you're, you know, you're usually, you're usually so chipper in the morning or you, you don't like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or I know you, I know you, 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 you don't like to, to go out on Friday nights. What that does is you're projecting number one, number two, you're actually like, like putting that person in a box, a professional relationship, an intimate relationship a family friend. When, when, when someone, and we've all, it's all happened to us before we've all had people in our lives. They're like, Hey, this is what you are like. You're like this. You always do this. You always think this it's fucking annoying and it's offensive. It's like, well, let me just be whoever I want to be. I don't change my mind tomorrow. Like, you know, maybe I've, maybe I've lost my temper before, but I'd like to change, but don't tell me what, who I am. So allowing just like dropping your assumptions letting the person have as much space as they need, as much time as they need, as, as flexibility to, to change their opinions and grow. Like that's a massive, massive, massive thing. And it, and it, works, for, uh, it works for professional relationships, for business relationships and, and intimate relationships. Just allow the person the space to make their own choices. And what happens is, is that they like that. The person that is, the, 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 when you're around someone that just lets you be, period, not be good, be funny, just be. When you just allow that person to be the be, then then it's it's really like attractive. It's really it's it's magnetic. People are drawn to that. Like, oh man, I can just kind of I can be silly right now if I want. And that won't be weird. I can be I can be serious. I can be sad. I'm given the space to be the person that I want to be. So those are those are, you know, some some sort of introductory tips for for relationships um and and if you I mean if you did if you did those things you your relationships would improve overnight yeah i love that especially about yeah telling the truth and things i know that's um something that tony robbins talks a lot about saying the truth will set you free you always tell the truth and even will smith's the same he always talks about um the truth is the only thing that's ever going to be constant so just tell the truth otherwise you like you said you know you're making up all their stories and you have to remember which story you told one person or vice versa and it just gets yeah all jumbled up so it's better to just to to go for it and say it as it is i guess yeah yeah as much as possible yeah so we'll get onto a little bit of the biohacking stuff now as well i, I um saw on instagram the other day that you were wearing a blood glucose monitor so do you want to sort of talk me through um, the science behind wearing that? Oh, there we go. There it is. Yeah. yeah sweet. Yeah. So I did a podcast with um, Dr. Casey Means. I hope I got her last name right. Um, she's a co-founder of Levels. And what Levels is, is a continuous glucose monitor. And um, what used to only be available for um people with diabetes now is, is streamlined in this, in this really incredible platform. Um, you log all the food you eat, uh, and then it gives you, uh, it gives you a reading of where your blood glucose is and it will, it will show you what sort of foods, um, are not so good for you. So it's shocker, but cucumbers like blast my glucose. Wow. I didn't think of cucumbers as much of a, like uh, not, not, not much glucose in a, in a cucumber, but for me, for whatever reason, I've had, I've tested it three times. And every time I have cucumber, like my blood, my blood glucose goes up. Uh, I did a, I did an episode with her. Um, metabolic flexibility is now the single most, um, I don't want to overstate it. Blood glucose is one of the most important um, biomarkers for longevity and health and immunity. If you have a, a flexible metabolism, and if your blood glucose is consistent and, and you have a piece of cake and it spikes up, does it stay up or does it come back down and normalize? So if you're flexible and you can eat an apple and it doesn't you know, skyrocket your blood glucose into a you know, diabetic or pre-diabetic zone, which is, you know, like, 150, 160 sort of range, then you are more resilient, more from sickness. You can bounce back, bounce back from disease faster. You're more, you're, you're, you're more fit. And so the blood glucose monitor, it's really, it's funny because I don't really do trackers very much. Like I've never had an aura ring. 
I've never, I don't wear a whoop strap or, you know, I don't count my steps. And, and the reason for me is, is a couple of things. Number one, I'm not interested in, in the continuous EMF transference on my body at all times. This is actually, you know, obviously there is cause it's this, this blood glucose monitor that's embedded into my skin is sending a signal to my phone. But this is the first time that I've ever done anything like this because I don't want to, I don't want an aura ring constantly pinging my phone all night while I sleep, you know, like there's no Wi-Fi in my house and I, you know, I, I take really good care to protect my sleep. Um, what I, what I am more of a fan of, of is sort of intuitive, intuitive eating, intuitive exercise. Or this is interoception. Interoception is this like internal sense of what you're doing, how you're doing. So it's like, what's going on inside your body? You know, are you inflamed? Are you, are you tired? Are you exhausted? Are you um, excited? When you can become your own barometer, your own awareness grows, and then you become better at picking the right foods for yourself. You're not, you know, you're, you're less likely to eat bad foods uh, if you are aware of what it's doing for your body. So, you know, of all of the devices and all of the trackers and, you know, the sort of transhumanist chips that are inserted and stuff like that's not, I don't love that. I'm not, I'm not really interested in that. What I'd rather do is, is get to know myself to, to such a high level that I, that I do it on my own. But yeah, I mean, we could go anywhere with biohacking. What, what, what else, what else do you want to dig into? Yeah, well, I think I've um, I had a couple of questions on, um, or oh, I guess it's not so much as a typical biohack to start with, but um, one of the questions I had was your float tanks and stuff as well. Um, one of my housemates who also has his own podcast, he's um, a big fan of doing float tanks. and He's actually got um, a float tank company here in Perth as a sponsor for his podcast. And he goes quite often to those. And it's something I've never actually done, but it's something I've always wanted to do and I've just never committed to it. So yeah, tell me about what the um, benefits are for you that you find for your own health. And then obviously you have um, your own company that you sold as well. So yeah, talk to me a bit um, about those. Your housemate has a sponsor of a float center and you've never been? What are you waiting for? Yeah, I know. It's, um, <laughs> it sounds pretty dumb, doesn't it? But yeah, I've just never- What are you waiting for? Yeah. Go, go work out like an animal. One of these days, just tell yeah. them, just say, Hey, let's go, let's go tomorrow or the day after work out like a beast, yeah. uh, fasted and then go float. Uh, the, the science around floating is vast and the benefits really center around the, 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 the physiological benefits are you absorb the magnesium through your skin. And when you absorb the magnesium, your, it lubricates your joints. It supports your back that the, you know, the almost zero gravity, you know, the weightlessness associated with floating on your back and a thousand pounds of Epsom salt water it increases circulation, decreases tension, reduces inflammation, helps you sleep better. That ma the magnesium sulfate that you absorb is just really good for your brain and your mitochondria. In addition to that, what it does is it shifts your central nervous system from a sympathetic state to a parasympathetic state. And the difference between the uh, sympathetic is like you have sympathy, you have, you have a response, a reaction to something. So in a sympathetic state, you're high alert, fight or flight, right? And you're reacting to the world around you in a way that you don't need to. You're not going to be eaten by a saber toothed tiger. You know, the world's not going to fall apart tomorrow. You don't need to be on high alert you know, the tribe around the fire, you know, you had to have a certain level of, of, uh, of awareness that you didn't get invaded by the other tribe in the middle of the night. But that's now that's, that's email has taken the place of that right now. So now email is like, Oh God, it's a stressful thing. Like, Oh, got all these emails I got to take care of. I'm so stressed out. Like, Oh God. So that, that sympathetic state when you're floating gives way to a parasympathetic state, which is rest and digest. So your, your, ability, your blood flow, literally your digestion, your heart rate, all of this stuff goes back to a normal level and you're actually able to recover in an expedited way. So one hour float is like four hours of REM sleep. It, yeah, right. it's, 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 it's massive. It's massive. In addition to that, there are the, the psychological benefits. So when you float, what it does, it, it also uh, quiets the default mode network. I spoke at the float conference, um, a couple of weeks ago 
and did a, pr a presentation on reprogramming your subconscious mind and how you can use floating uh, to develop yourself to get better. And a big part of that is the default mode network in your brain is kind of where your ego sits. It's this, oh, I'm this way. When, if you think about the, you know, the root of default mode, what, what's your default mode? When, when you're not thinking about anything and you're not doing anything, what's your default mode? Are you um, stressed out, freaked out and anxious? Or are you calm, confident and balanced? And the default mode network also is what drives the, you know, the sort of red root chakra, like stay alive, right? Stay alive first and foremost. And that, that, all of that comes from, you know, the amygdala, these, these, these impulses that we have, you know, to fight, flight, flee, fight, flight, freeze, or fuck. Those are the, those are the transcend when you can transcend those, those, um, those, instincts that come from your ego, from your, um, your sympathetic nervous system, the benefits are immense. So I've, we've, I've, you know, had Russell Wilson from the Seahawks, um, you know, members from the Seattle Sounders, college football Olympians come in and float because it's, there's just nothing like it for me, it, as far as a, a, a recovery practice, there's just nothing like it. you can't, you can't, you can't undo sleep. Like sleep, of course, is really critical, uh, it, fundamental, the most important thing, really. Um, but if you need real deep recovery, you need real route relaxation. Float tanks are are just an incredible, a cr incredible thing. And for you, you know, what I would suggest you do is is float three times in a week. Yeah. You know, have them hook you up. Go float three times in a week. Float fasted and worked out like midday and then the next time go float at the end of a work day at night and then the third time you know smoke some weed and and jump in the float tank or eat an edible because sometimes it can get scratch in your throat a little bit and then have like a, a really a really deep experience it's there's just nothing like it and and when i when i started my float center here in seattle in 2012 there were 35 float centers in the country and now there's like 800. So people are catching on. There, there should be as many float centers as there are yoga centers, in my opinion. Yeah, that's awesome. So what do you think about um, cryotherapy and infrared saunas then as well? Yeah, I like cryo. I've done cryo a dozen times or so. I do, I do like it. I like the way it feels. You know, it makes sense when you're, when you're doing negative 215 degrees for in a couple of different ways. It's not just that you're cold. What it does is when you're doing cryo, you're actually freezing your, your trunk, your core, your intestines, right? And when you're doing cryo, blood comes in from your extremities to protect your vital organs. And it's like, oh my God, we're, we're going to freeze to death. So it ushers in blood from your extremities. And then when you're done, that's really where the magic happens. When you step out of a, out of a cryo session, all that blood like rushes back out to your limbs and, and that increases circulation, it increases white blood cells, increases recovery because all this blood is just shooting back out all over your body and that's where the real benefits are. So I, I like it. I, 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 don't, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't start a cryo center business. I wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't be sort of a core biohack that I would use. Uh, unlike the infrared sauna, which is insane. I, I have one in my house. I, you know, I use it probably four or five days a week, nights a week. And, and, and typically, you know, because I have kids after they go to bed, I do a little bit of work. I watch a little bit of TV with the wife. I, I typically work out. I do my, I do my X3 bar at like nine o'clock at night. Oftentimes then I'll meditate in the infrared sauna, be in there for, you know, 25 to 45 minutes at about 145 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I, as soon as I do that, I go into a cold shower in, uh, and then meditate again, sort of, you know, relax again, and then, and then head to bed. Um, it's massive. And the, and the, the studies around all cause mortality, you know, the Nordic countries really nailed the, the saunas, you know, the, the, the thermogenesis going hot, cold, hot, cold. It feels it's very social. It's a part of their culture is to go, you know, you're with your friends and family for a little bit and then go, you know, jump in a, jump in a friggin' 
icy lake. It feels amazing, and, and the, the benefits for longevity are, are really, really strongly, really strongly correlated. There's, there's a ton of great studies that show, like, you're just going to live longer. If you, if you do an infrared sauna two, three, four times a week, 25 to 45 minutes, you're going you're gonna to live a long time. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of uh, especially infrared saunas. Yeah, I've seen a, um, a couple of different ones popping up around Perth recently too. So it's definitely becoming more popular, like you said, and it's definitely something I need to start doing myself, especially in terms of recovery and just different bits and pieces. It's, um, yeah, with, along with the float tanks, it's, yeah, definitely something I'm going to start doing, I think. So I know you're um, quite a big fan of fasting as well from what I can gather. So do you want to talk to me about what the benefits of fasting have for you? Yeah, I... I, I... I am so glad that I started fasting when I did, you know, just skipping breakfast alone is, is a game changer. If you fast overnight and you skip breakfast and, and, and eat lunch at whenever you do it, it the, the, the research on uh, longevity, um, calorie restriction, uh, autophagy, where you're, you're, you're actually making better cells and old cells are, are dying away and uh, unused, you know, it helps uh, regulate hormones. You know, it, it, it decreases um, glucose. It's it, for me, it, it, it's, it's awesome because I love to eat. Like, um, you know, I, I was a pretty chubby little kid for, you know, second grade till like eighth grade. I was, you know, till chubber and, um, so I, you know, I love food and it's a big part of how I share uh, time with my family and we love to cook, we love to eat out. Uh, and so it, it's, it's more meaningful if I can just skip, skip breakfast and, and break my fast at 12 or one o'clock and do, you know, eat and um, sardines and olives and some cashews, you know, try to eat keto largely like 80, 20. And it, 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 you save a bunch of money. Cause if I was eating breakfast every day, like that's another like 15, 20 bucks every day that I would just hammer down with eggs and bacon and stuff. I, I make bacon for my kids who are seven and four, probably four days a week. And I don't ever eat any of it. Um, because I'm, I, I'm now conditioned. I'm, I don't have hunger in the morning and hitting that 18 hour fast by skipping breakfast is has been massively beneficial to me it's it's helped me lose weight maintain my weight and um, really sort of reprogrammed my metabolism you know you have to you have to get into a place where your your metabolic fluctuation is under control and you know mark sisson has a lot of good stuff on on how to like really reset your metabolism and i think he's got like a six or seven day protocol for doing that um I'm looking at doing a uh, five-day water fast um, next week. I just did an episode with um, Bob Troya, goes by Quantified Bob. He did a five-day water fast, and I and I've done I've done a three-day before, and it was hard. Uh, but I think I'm going to do five and see what the see wow. what the glu- glucose monitor says. I don't know. I and now that I've said it, I should probably do it. But <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 the the research really supports it. It, it saves money. And it helps your physique more than more more than I think you would expect. Yeah. What sort of um, other diets have you tried in the past? Have you ever tried vegan or carnivore? Or because I know both of those are pretty popular at the moment, and they're kind of butting heads and going back and forth as to which one's more optimal for longevity and optimal health and things like that. So have you tried either of those? Yeah, I've never tried veganism. I did vegetarianism in college because I thought it would help me lose weight. It didn't. And, and uh, to be honest, I think it gave me candida, something that I've, that I'm still kind of dealing with, like a sort of a gut overgrowth of, of negative flora. Uh, instead of eating meat, I just drank more beer and ate a bunch of bread and cheese. So it was like this stupid 21 and knucklehead, like, oh, I'll just no, I'll eat meat because I'm gonna lose weight. I'm not going to eat, you know, the pepperoni on the cheese pizza <laughs> like that. <laughs> I did, I did dabble with dumb, dumb vegetarianism and call different trends. Sorry, I just, am um, I, am I, am, yeah, I just am missed I that last bit. Or is that on yeah. your end? 
I think it might be on okay. my end. Yeah. Uh, it's all good. I'll just keep rolling because you can you can edit this. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been paying really close attention, you know, to to Rob Wolf, who I've been reading for a long, long time, is kind of the father of the paleo movement. Um, had him on the podcast, and we and all we talked about was like soil. We talked about uh, regenerative farming, farming, which is a big focus for him now. So I tried, you know, I did paleo. That was really effective. I did um, um, I did carnivore for um, for a full month last January, not this January, January before. And uh, whoa, there goes my microphone. And uh, <laughs> I did I did it for a full month, and I liked it. Uh, it what it did actually was it did, re, it did here here the benefits that I felt was an increase in libido, um, a little bit of um, uh, increase a little bit less inflamed. I, I slept a little bit better, but I also wasn't really fighting any sort of like immune, uh, you know, immunodeficiency or anything like that. So it was like just for experimental purposes, but I was like, you know, I was having like a ribeye every day, you know, six eggs, 10 pieces of bacon, sour cream, and um, just steaks and steaks and steaks. So now what I, what I eat now is sort of like a modified carnivore. It's not really, but it's, but it's basically 70, 30 meat to vegetables. Most of the time, you know, I'll have some nuts. Sometimes I'll have some olives. Sometimes I'll have a piece of fruit occasionally once a week or something. But the, what I found about veganism is, it, and I've done probably veganism, you know, the myths that go along with it. It, to me, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it, you're missing out on essential foods that helped us grow our brains. Like we evolved eating these animal proteins that helped us meet, get the cholesterol that we needed in order for our brains to work. And I, I know some people in my life that are vegetarian or vegan and they're, they're, they look way older than they are. I mean, they look, you know, 35, 36 and they look 45, um, you know, kind of skinny fat and, I hope that they don't know that I'm referencing them when they listen to this podcast, frankly, but it, to me, it just, it doesn't make sense. And, and I've listened to enough experts, Rob Wolf, Sean Baker, Dr. Paul Saladino, who have talked about like the, the, these are the essential things that you're missing. It just, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. And the moral aspect of it is also been debunked, right? Cow farts are not putting um, a hole in the ozone. It's just not happening. It's, it's not. In fact, regenerative farming um, small farms are actually contributing back to the soil because cow poop and chicken poop and duck poop and goats and sheep all increase um, nutrient density in soils. So it's really important to have livestock. And then there's the, you know, meat is murder thing. And it's like, well, the, the, uh, the quinoa bowl that you had for lunch used up massive amounts of water you know, an almond, one almond takes something like five gallons of water in order to, to create, which is absurd to me. And when you're eating grains and wheat, you're, you know, all the turbines that are harvesting the monocrop, which has been depleted and probably treated with glyphosate is also grinding up little rodents and bunnies and shit. So unless you're like foraging for your own food and, and picking leaves off of mint in your backyard, and that's how you eat, which nobody does, uh, it's, it's just not sustainable. So for me, I think for the, what makes the most sense for me, so the cow that I've been eating off of for the past six months was a cow, a grass fed cow raised by my cousin who lives, you know, 300 miles away. And, you know, I eat the, I eat the organ meat, I eat the liver, the kidneys, the tongue, the heart, I've got ground beef and steaks. And so I've been eating off of that. You know, I'm supporting my, my cousin and his farm. I'm, I'm eating an animal that lived a really freaking sweet life. You know, the happy cow. And then, um, and now it's providing nourishment for my family. And I think that I, I, I'm more interested in doing that that way. And I'm also trying to, to increase my muscle mass. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, on staying strong and, and having lots of lean muscle mass. And you just can't do that on, you know, bean sprouts. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing that um, for me is one of my housemates is vegan and I'm, I know a couple of other people that are vegan too. And it's kind of like, I always sort of look at them and think, you know, or maybe they are feeling better than what I am or something because I've never actually tried it. But then again, kind of like what you said, it just doesn't make sense from even an evolutionary standpoint, looking at 
our um, human ancestors and thinking that we wouldn't be here today as humans if we hadn't have eaten the meats with the omega-3s and stuff like that in it that actually allowed our brains to develop to literally be where we are today. So it's something that for me, I just can't go past the evolutionary standpoint for now to get, you know, I, I guess if there was conclusive science to come out to say vegan is optimal, I'd do it. But for now there's, you know, there's nothing like that. So it's never going to happen. Never going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So um, what other biohacks do you sort of do to um, improve your sleep? Yeah. Well, the blue blocking glasses every night are huge. Um, I keep my bed dark and cold, like um, blackout. Well, I also just moved out to the country um, from Seattle four months ago with my family. So it's really quiet. The cook every single night, but um, I keep my room really dark, really quiet. Um, I have my own blanket. My, I don't, I don't share a comforter with my wife. I've learned that a long time ago. It's just, I've run hot, you know, I'm, I'm like a radiator, you know, and she's, and she's always cold. So it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, I, you know, the, inf the, the infrared sauna, <laughs> um, before bed is good. You know, um, if I'm feeling kind of wired, sometimes I'll do a little apple cider, apple cider vinegar and a little bit of honey and a little bit of lemon and a little like tea in the evening time, which is good for your gut and also helps, helps you relax and get ready for sleep. But, but by far the blue blocking glasses are the most important biohack that I've ever experienced for protecting sleep. You know, the, the exposure to our eyeballs in blue, uh, with blue light every single night just suppresses melatonin and, and keeps you wired, tricks your brain into thinking it's daytime. If I'm, if I have, there's a product called GABA brain food from natural stacks. Um, natural natural stacks used to be the producer of the of the podcast of the optimal performance podcast they make a, a gaba brain food which is it's it's like you're not eating gaba but in gaba is basically the breaks mental breaks like can you stop you know can you can you pump the brakes if your brain is going out of control it's relaxing it helps your helps your thoughts kind of settle um so I use that for a night. Sometimes I got a, I got sent a bottle of blue vervain, um, which I've been taking recently in evening times, which is also a, uh, it's a tincture that I did sublingual under the tongue. So I'll take that at night. Sometimes if I'm feeling a little bit wired, I use a lot of CBD. Um, I use, uh, there's a company called Jane, you can go to withjane.com. super awesome CBD products. They make a mellow zone that has just a tiny, like basically like a microdose of lavender, uh, and it's like this super high quality organic hemp that, uh, that it's, that it's, um, synthesized from or, or extracted from. And so, yeah, what else, what else do I do for sleep? Cold showers sometimes help yeah. get ready for sleep. I like that. I think that's it. Yeah, no, that's sweet. Um, yeah, the blue light blocking glasses for me have definitely had a profound impact and, um, even taking the GABA supplements as well as something I've done a little bit of in the past too. And I found that they're quite good, but yeah, it's um, be nice to get some CBD in Australia. A lot of the ones here we have have to be very low dose or you know, barely even have any of the um, proper ingredients in it anyway. So until they sort of lift some of the bans and regulations and stuff and can't really get some good sources of it, but hopefully they'll do that soon because it's yeah, definitely something I'm quite interested in and something I want to try a lot more of, but we don't really have the access that I guess you guys in the U S have got a little bit more depending on what state you're in and stuff as well too. So it's, um, yeah, well, ho hopefully in time that will shift. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions left. Um, the last one in terms of not so much biohacking, but in terms of your own physical fitness, what do you sort of do for your own exercise? Cause I know something that, um, Dave Asprey talked a little bit about in his book, headstrong in terms of longevity and stuff was doing a lot of high intensity interval training and not necessarily a lot of, resistance training in proportion to the amount of hit training that he was doing and stuff. So do you follow something similar or are you a little bit different with yours? I, I, I don't really make the time. I was going to say, I don't have the time to work out, but that's a cop out. So, uh, I, I would much rather, well, it's easier with the gyms closed. Um, I would much rather get a full workout in as short amount of time as possible and play with my kids or go to the beach with my kids. So I found two years ago, uh, the X three bar, the X3 bar is insane. It is, it is absolutely insane. Um, it's a, it's a series of band exercises. 
it's industrial bar. There's four, there's two different workouts. One is a push day. One is a pull day. They both have legs on the push day. It's, um, it's chest press, tricep extension, either lat pull-ups or, uh, or military press. Um, and then front squats. And then on pull day, it's curls, uh, bent over rows, um, deadlift and calf raise. And that's all I do. The exercise takes 10 minutes. It, the whole entire exercise takes 10 minutes and I'm in the best physique of, I've ever had in my entire life. I mean, I was a college athlete and I'm more fit now at 37 than I ever have been. And it's, and it's literally 10 minutes a day, six days a week. It's fun. It's fucking hard. The, the, the sign, it, it also, in fact, I've got the book right here. Uh, there's a book I've had Dr. Jake wish on the, on the optimal performance podcast three times. Yeah, he wrote right. a book called weightlifting is a waste of time. And so is cardio provocative title, but, but he shows his work. He shows the science about why that's the case. So you're actually getting high intensity interval training by doing this because it's really, really hard. And the, the resistance is, you know, up to 500 pounds with the bench, with the bench press. Um, but because you're in control, the entire motion, unlike weightlifting, where it's like, you have to push to get it up and then you lock out and then you have to like uh, manage it while well, it comes back down. You're turning on and off those muscles. And with this, you don't do, you don't go to, ever go to extension in any of the lifts. For me, man, I mean, it is, it's, it's insane, this, this system. Um, uh, I, I've had tons of friends buy this. I've had tons of listeners of my podcast buy it. And the, the Facebook users group has just testimonial after testimonial. So I do that six days a week. It's 10 fucking minutes. And then the rest of the time I get to, you know, play with my kids or go for walks or jump on the trampoline. So I do a little bit of like, you know, slow, consistent movement, which is obviously shown to increase longevity too. But I just, I just want to simplify everything. I want to, I want to make things as as the, the most from the least and the X3 is the thing for me. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. I'll definitely have to give that book a rate, I think, because that's, um, yeah, provoked a little bit of thought in me because I'm quite into the sort of physique and bodybuilding type stuff. And I love the sort of the long training sessions at the gym, but then sometimes you get to a point where it's kind of, you feel like you're in there for too long and you kind of wish you could just, yeah, do like you say, do um, less time, but then, oh, there it is. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That'll be, um, that'll be quite interesting. I'll definitely give that one a read. Yeah. Um, so sweet. Before I get into my final two questions, where can people find all of your content? Yeah, you can find um, the Optimal Performance Podcast everywhere. It's on all the players. It's a little bit of everything. If, if you vibe with any of the things that I've been saying, you're going to like this podcast. It's, it's, there's 270, 280 episodes. Uh, it's a deep, deep, deep dive into lots of cool shit. Um, designed specifically to help you live your most best life, your optimal life. Um, uh, it's it, it's provocative at times. So you can go there. You can find me there. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at real Sean McCormick, S E A N McCormick. Um, it's a green logo. You can see my face. Those are probably the two other, the, the two best places to follow up. Awesome. I'll put links to those in the show notes as well for everyone to take a look at. Now, uh, second last question. So this is one I like to ask all of my guests um, kind of on the spot just to, I guess, get the best answer from them so they don't really have the time to think about the optimal answer in a way I kind of like them to just go from straight from the heart. So with this one, I want you to imagine that you have the opportunity to speak to every single person on earth at one time. So you literally, you might be on like a TV screen or something and every single person on the planet is listening to you speak. They've all got translators for different languages and stuff, but you can only give them three pieces of advice. So your three top things you would tell the world, what would they be? Top three things. The first thing would be um, make decisions from a place of love. Love first. Whatever it is that whatever it is that you need help figuring out, whatever decision that you that you need to make, love, love yourself, love your neighbor, love the world, love the planet first and foremost. Uh, the second thing is uh, sleep. We have to sleep. Everyone's better off if we got better sleep. It, it, is, it is increasingly important, especially now in this day and age, for us to get high quality sleep, and that means different things for different for different people. Some of us need a little bit more than others, but sleep. Sleep is just uh, this massive, massive cure-all. Um, and uh, 
um, I guess the third thing is, you know, reincarnation is real. You've been here before, likely. You're likely to come back. Um, so even when it's over, it's not over. Learn the lessons that you need to learn in this life. Make mistakes. And then understand the mistakes that you made. Learn from them. Adjust. Because this, this cyclical nature of, 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 this, of this existence on this, you know, galactic marble, this blue organic marble floating in space is that we, we have a limited time here um, and we get to try things out. So um, enjoy, in, enjoy your life. Awesome, man. Love it. So final question. I invited you to come onto the show today because I believe you are someone that is state of the art and pretty much lives, lives out what I believe is the true meaning of being state of the art. So in your opinion, what does it mean to be state of the art or what is your definition of being so? I think the definition of state of the artist is to um, be willing to change your mind, be open to, to innovating, um, forget what you know, to make adjustments. To, it's okay to be wrong. There's, there's going to be innovations. There's going to be uh, improvements in thought, in technique, in, in approach. And in order to, to actually take advantage of those, those advancements, those, those changes in, in the world, we have to be willing to, to, to be wrong. So I think that it's important that you keep an open mind because nobody has all the answers and it's going to sh shift tomorrow. It's going to be different tomorrow. So be okay being wrong sometimes. Awesome, man. Great answer. Well, Sean, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.